Thank you very much. And that's what the gospel is all about. Because the life that the Lord Jesus lived 1900 years ago only condemns us. The Christian life is the life that he lived then, lived now. By him. In us. Because the life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. But the death that he died qualifies us to receive the life that he lived. And this was the tremendous discovery that the apostles had to make. For as we saw last evening, though for three solid years they were exposed to the teachings of the Lord Jesus and to the supreme example of the Lord Jesus, Without exception, every one of them, at the end of three years, were a total abject failure. Abject failure. They neither wanted the cross, the cross, nor did they believe in his resurrection. In his resurrection. But in the upper room, the upper room, the upper room after, the Lord Jesus after the Lord Jesus was risen from the dead, and he appeared to them and was in their midst and showed them his hands and his feet and they touched him. In the rediscovery of the risen Lord, they found a new joy, a new Bible, a new message, a new responsibility, and were promised by the risen living Lord Jesus the new enabling. whereby they were to enter into the good of his atoning death by becoming the recipients of his resurrection life. That's where we closed our session last evening. And if you'll turn with me now to the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 1, we're going to talk for a little while at the outset of this evening session about the fulfillment that the promise made the Lord Jesus, the promise the Lord Jesus made to them in the upper room which was but a reiteration of the promise that had already been made and recorded for us in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. In the first chapter of the Acts, the former treaties have I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And what Luke is here quite obviously conveying is that having recorded in Luke's gospel the things that the Lord Jesus began to do and to teach, he's now about to put on record the things that the Lord Jesus continued to do and to teach. And the only essential difference between the record of the Acts and the record of Luke's gospel is the humanity that was used by the Lord Jesus for the accomplishment of what he wanted to do and teach. But it was the same Lord Jesus Christ. The same life, but instead of his activity being clothed with his own humanity, as in Luke's Gospel, now his activity was clothed by the redeemed humanity of the apostles and the disciples. But the activity recorded was not the activity of the apostles, it was the activity of Jesus Christ. It's a misnomer to call it the Acts of the Apostles. In point of fact, it's the record of the continued Acts and the continued teachings of the Lord Jesus, clothed with the humanity of forgiven sinners, who on the basis of, a, of his atoning death had entered into the good of his God-imparted resurrection life. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, eating together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, 
But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So that during this period of 40 days from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus until his ascension, when he went to be again to share with the Father the glory that had been his before ever the world was, he instructed his disciples. It was a six weeks short term Bible school. And it preceded that climactic event whereby the disciples became the recipients of the indwelling resurrection life of the Lord Jesus through the gift to them of his other self, the Holy Spirit, or paraclete, the Comforter, which the Lord Jesus describes here as the baptism with the Holy Ghost, and which Peter, as we shall later discover, describes as the beginning for him, and the beginning for the other apostles, and the beginning for the church. In other words, between the upper room experience where the Lord Jesus stood in their midst and showed them his hands and his feet and they touched him, and the day of Pentecost, when the promise that he gave them there was fulfilled, there was a time lag in which they were intellectually convinced of his resurrection, but had not as then entered into the good of it. But they were commanded to tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until this endowment of power came upon them. Now we want to focus our attention for a few moments tonight upon this which is here described as the baptism with the Holy Ghost and about which today there is considerable confusion. We have to recognize that until Pentecost the disciples were not spiritually regenerate in the New Testament sense. This is something about which folk are a little bit confused. The church was born at Pentecost. That was the beginning. For it was on the day of Pentecost that the Lord Jesus fulfilled the promise that he gave to them. That he would, on his ascension to the Father, pray the Father that he would give the Holy Ghost. Who was then with them in his person, but who as from the day of Pentecost would be in them. And by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were to be added to that new body corporate called the church, in which the Lord Jesus, himself, the same Lord Jesus, the very same Lord Jesus, would continue to do and to teach, as in his own humanity he had already been doing and been teaching. What happened on the day of Pentecost was simply that these 120 men and women on the grounds of Christ's redemptive act entered into the regenerative purpose for which Christ died. The restoration of the life of God to the soul of man. An entirely new and unique situation was created on the day that the Holy Spirit came to take up residence within the redeemed humanity of these 120 men and women. For the Lord Jesus now, instead of having the body that the Father had prepared for him, miraculously conceived of the Holy Spirit and fashioned in the womb of Mary and born at Bethlehem, instead of having that body, now the Father had presented to the Lord Jesus a new body. A body made up of 120 men and women, each of whom, as forgiven sinners, became members of that body in particular. And this was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which of course must not be confused with what elsewhere in the New Testament is described as the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If you turn with me to the first epistle to the Corinthians in the 12th chapter, 1 Corinthians and chapter 12, <clears throat> Here we read in the 12th verse, As the body is one and hath many members, 
and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is Christ the reference of course is being made to the human body that just as you and I in our human body have many members in particular that make up that body fingers and feet ears and a nose and eyes these members of the body being members in particular are nonetheless identified in one corporate hall and they are identified as I mentioned to you the other evening by the common possession <coughs> of the same life and being subject to the same head so also is Christ verse 13 for by one spirit the Holy Spirit are we all baptized into one body if you and I have become members of the body of Christ it is only because we have been baptized into that body <coughs> by the Holy Spirit this is the baptism with the Holy Ghost for as some of us have been discussing in some detail in the morning sessions the essential consequence of man's fall into sin was the forfeiture of the life of God which constituted death as the penalty of sin for the wages of sin is the absence of life death the absence of what life physical death physical life no <clears throat> the wages of sin is the absence of God's life so that you and I are born in this world totally destitute of the life of God alienated from the life of God physically alive soulishly active but spiritually dead we're cut off from God's life this is the natural condition in which the natural fallen man as the fallen seed of a fallen Adam is born into this world on the grounds of redemption being now reconciled to God through his atoning work upon the cross God is prepared for his dear sake whose death has made it possible to restore those who claim by faith the good of his redemptive act God is prepared to restore to such his presence by the gift to them of his Holy Spirit and this is the this is the regenerated purpose that lies behind the redemptive act and the moment the Holy Spirit the third co-equal member of the triune deity in whose person the Father and the Son are equally comprehended the moment the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence within the human spirit of the redeemed sinner in that moment of time that individual be it man woman or child of any nation creed or class or color is instantly the possessor of none nothing other than the very life of Jesus Christ himself and is by the presence of the Holy Ghost thus baptized into body membership now this is the beginning for any individual as Pentecost was the beginning for the church in general in the epistle to the Ephesians Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6 to the praise of the glory of his grace G-R-A-C-E God's riches at Christ's expense that's grace the unmerited favor of God to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he God hath made us sinners accepted in the beloved Jesus in whom Jesus we have redemption how do we have redemption in Jesus through his blood What's the result of the shedding of his blood? The forgiveness of sins. Because we deserve it? No. According to the riches of his grace. Now, there's the redemptive act. This is the basis of our reconciliation to God. In Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. But that isn't salvation that's our reconciliation this is the premise of our salvation this is the prerequisite of our salvation that we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins 
But that wasn't the purpose for which Jesus died. Verse 13. In whom the Lord Jesus, ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In other words, having heard the gospel or the good news of your salvation, having been exposed to the possibility of reconciliation to God on the grounds of redemption, having forgiveness of sins through the shed blood of Jesus as the vicarious and atoning sacrifice, you trusted. You entered into the good of his atoning work upon the cross. In whom the Lord Jesus... After that you believed, when you by faith had invoked his redemptive activity, you were sealed, how? With the Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you entered into the good of his atoning death, you received that for which he died. The restoration of God's life by the gift of his spirit to your spirit, whose presence within you alone and exclusively, verse 14, is the earnest of your inheritance. That word earnest is an old English word that simply means guarantee. Stamp, hallmark. The only valid evidence that a man is redeemed. The presence of the Holy Ghost. In whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise who himself is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Every redeemed sinner is sealed as the blood-bought poverty of Jesus Christ by the restoration to his human spirit of God the Holy Spirit. And this is the only valid hallmark of a true child of God. And no matter how a man or a woman or a child may claim to be redeemed, may claim to be regenerate, may claim to be a child of God, may claim to be saved, if there is not the presence of the Holy Spirit within the human spirit of that individual, they are an imposter, they are a reprobate, they are a counterfeit. Now this, of course, is the strength of what Paul had to say to the Corinthian church, as we have already cited from the last 13th chapter of the second epistle, where... Paul, having written two long letters to this particular company of professing believers, he says, now in the light of all that I have to say to you, examine yourselves and prove yourselves whether you be in the faith or not. And what was the criteria? That they were accredited by some religious society? No. That they had learned by heart a certain number of Bible verses? No. What was the criterion? That they had been baptized as believers? Most certainly, no. No. What was the criteria? No. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. He said, know you not that Jesus Christ is in you. Unless you're a counterfeit. Now how is Jesus Christ in you? The Lord Jesus Christ comes to you in the person of his Holy Spirit. On the grounds that he has given himself for you upon the cross. The Lord Jesus takes up residence by his Holy Spirit within the human spirit of every redeemed sinner. And this constitutes our body membership of the true church of Jesus Christ. If you turn with me to the third chapter of the epistle to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. So by the scripture being the record of what God had to say, the gospel was made known to Abraham. In that God said to him, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So God's saving purpose was explained to Abraham. And there was promised through his seed the blessing. 
Now, we're left in absolutely no doubt, of course, as to the one indicated by God when he spoke of Abraham's seed. This is indicated very clearly for us in the 16th verse of the same chapter. Galatians 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. In other words, what God had to say did not concern a race of men or some national culture that they would offer to mankind. But specifically, what God had to say to Abraham was to Abraham and to his seed, singular. Not as of many, but as of one, end of verse 16, to thy seed, singular, which is Christ. In other words, whatever the blessing may have been that God promised should come through the seed of Abraham, it was to come through the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, what was the blessing that God promised should become yours and mine in the person of Jesus Christ? It was gospel. For the 8th verse tells us that the gospel, this good news, was preached right there and then to Abraham, promising the blessing. Now, by your understanding of the gospel, in your connotation of the word, what would you have imagined God was promising by this gospel to Abraham and to be consummated in the person of Jesus Christ? Well, of course, you might imagine that what God was promising to Abraham to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ was the forgiveness of our sins. Our deliverance from the puni punitive consequence of our guilt. That one day we would go to heaven and share his kingdom forever. But of course that isn't true. As Paul here specifically is at pains to explain. Because it is at this very point that the Galatian Christians have got a weak gospel. And because at this point they've got a weak gospel, they had a weak Christianity. And it was to correct the weakness of the lives they lived, derived from the weakness of the gospel they had, that Paul is writing this epistle to the Galatians. Because Paul knew perfectly well that if these Galatian Christians persisted in a weak gospel, they would destroy themselves in every future generation. Because Paul knew perfectly well that a weak gospel can never reproduce itself in strength. It can only reproduce itself in greater weakness. And the Galatian Christians had completely missed the point of their salvation. And the situation as it applied to the Galatian church then is by and large the situation as it applies to the evangelical church of Jesus Christ in the 20th century. Our gospel today, by and large, is as weak, if not weaker, than the gospel that was being embraced by the Galatian Christians. And of course, if we were to persist in our day and generation in propagating a weak gospel, then we are sowing the seeds of inevitable calamity and disaster in the next decade. And if we per if we propagate a weak gospel, we may anticipate that we'll have absolutely nothing but trouble with our children when they grow up in our Christian homes. And I believe that by and large, the reason that there are so many rebel children of evangelical believers is that they have only been exposed to a weak gospel. And they've never been introduced to the true spiritual content of their faith. And they've had only... in Pinged upon them, projected upon them certain external patterns of evangelical behavior and they've never been introduced to the dynamic of a living faith that's calculated completely to revolutionize a man's character. In other words, as I've sometimes described it, we have reared a whole generation of professing Christian boys and girls who are no more, quite frankly, no more than evangelically house trained. But without any any real spiritual or moral convictions. They've simply learned evangelical language. And we're constantly being shocked at their bad behavior. And I'll tell you who's to blame. 
a generation of Christians who precede them, who have simply perpetuated in their children a gospel as weak as the gospel they know. That's why you may anticipate, if you persist in a weak gospel, that your churches will be half empty in 15 years' time. And you'll have a whole amount of surplus real estate on your hands in another generation. What was the blessing that God promised in the gospel that he preached to faithful Abraham? Verse 13 of Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Well, there you are, you say? There you are. There's redemption. That was the gospel. Christ died for our sins. That's exactly what we believe. That's exactly what we've been preaching. Christ died for our sins. Yes, you're right. Christ died for our sins. But that wasn't the gospel. Nor was that the blessing that God promised to faithful Abraham. Because you haven't read the 14th verse. All you've read in the 13th verse is the premise, the prerequisite, the essential precursor. All you've been introduced to in the 13th verse is the threshold over which everybody inevitably must cross if they are to enter into the good of that for which God sent the seed of faithful Abraham. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that to this end the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Through the Jesus Christ who was made a curse for us, in that he was nailed to a cross through that Jesus who was the seed of Abraham came to implement the redemptive act through him there may now come upon us as the Gentiles the blessing of the gospel which God preached to faithful Abraham that continuing in verse 14 we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith so why was Christ made a curse for us why did he die upon the cross why was his blood shed? That you and I, having forgiveness of sins through his vicarious sufferings, might receive the seal of God the Holy Ghost and our humanity be reoccupied, re-inhabited, and re-monopolized by God himself. Nothing less than that is involved in gospel. And if I presume to stand before men and women and boys and girls and simply invite them to come to Jesus and have their sins forgiven and expose them to nothing more than that of God's total demands upon every area of their humanity in every crack and crevice of their human personality so that body, soul, spirit, mind, emotion and will they become the unchallenged blood-bought property of Jesus Christ in all that they are and all that they possess I am doing violence to the truth that God has entrusted to me. Christ redeemed you upon the cross so that in the power of his resurrection he might come and re-inhabit your humanity in the person of the Holy Spirit so that you might be added by his presence within you to that body corporate of which he is the head and you have become on the grounds of redemption and through spiritual regeneration a member in particular. And this is the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Chapter 4 of the same epistle. Verse 4. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. There was a redemptive act that Guilty sinners might be reconciled to a holy God and instead of being enemies, they might become sons. But because you're sons, because you Galatian Christians have by faith invoked the redemptive activity of the crucified Jesus, because you're sons, what's happened? God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. 
who bears witness to your spirit from within that you are now children of God and you cry, Abba, Father. And that was why he died to redeem you. That restored to sonship you might receive the Holy Ghost. That your humanity might be re-inhabited by Jesus Christ himself. What then will be the only valid characteristic that distinguishes a true child of God from other unregenerate human beings? Well, it's quite obvious. Romans chapter 8. Verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. How many? As many as. Any more than that? No. Any less than that? No. Can you remember any other verse that commences that way? John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 12. As many as. How many? As many as. Any more than that? No. Any less than that? No. As many as. John 1 verse 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. That's how you become a son of God. How do you become a son of God? You receive him. How do you have to receive him? As a great philosopher? As a supreme example, as a wonderful man, as a supreme teacher? No, no. As many as received him, believing on his name. What's his name? Jesus. Why do they call him Jesus? Matthew one twenty one. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. In other words, there is a specific dimension in which you have got to receive him. You've got to receive him, believing on his name. And if you believe on his name, Jesus, for he saves his people from their sins, you simply credit him as you receive him with the office in which he came, Redeemer. And that's what it means to receive him believing on his name. You can't receive him as a teacher. Nicodemus did that. But he didn't redeem him. You can't receive him as an example because the life he lived will only damn you as surely as the Lord damns you. Because on the basis of your performance, you no more fulfill the life he lived than the law God gave. When you receive him in order to become a child of God, you have to receive him in the office in which he came. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And as many as received him, believing on his name, to them gave God power to become what by nature they weren't, sons of God. That's how you become a Christian. Now, you may not yet have become a Christian. Because as yet you may not have received him, believing on his name. If I were in a strange city on vacation and was wanting to buy some bread, I'd find a baker. And if I was in some little country district, perhaps in Europe, I'd see a little sign outside. It's a big brass dish. And Bäckerei, if it was in Germany, or Baker in England. And I'd go inside, and I'd say, I'd like some bread. And the man would say, I'm sorry, I don't sell bread. I only sell cabbages and coal. And I'd say to you, but it says baker outside. He says, yes, I know it says baker outside, but I only sell coal and cabbages. What would you say to that man? You'd say, you're not as good as your name. You're not faithful to your name. I came in here believing on your name. That's what it means. If you went into the hairdressers because you saw barber outside and the man came and stuck a thing round your neck and then said, which is the tooth that hurts? You might be a bit alarmed. And you would say, I came in here to have a haircut. And he'd say, I'm sorry, so I only take teeth out. But he says, barber outside. He says, I know, but I only extract teeth. Well, you'd say, you're not as good as your name, you see. Now, the wonderful thing about the Lord Jesus is that he is as good and as great as his name. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his holy name. That's the reason why I love him so. And when you receive him believing on his name, God gives you for his dear sake the right to become. 
In other words, you've gone over the threshold. You have fulfilled the first prerequisite of salvation, but only the first prerequisite. On the grounds of his death, you have been reconciled to God. But from now on, what is going to be the characteristic of your life as one who has become, because you are numbered amongst the as many as who have received him, believing on his name? What's going to be the stamp and characteristic of your daily walk? The only thing that can ever add validity to your claim to have become. They that are led by the Spirit of God. They are in the process of being the sons of God. As many as received him believing on his name, to them he gives the power to become crisis. But as many as are, process of being, daily walk, one step at a time, one day at a time, one breath at a time, as many as are led by the Holy Ghost, they are being sons of God. And you only have a valid claim to have become when it becomes patently obvious to everybody that you are being what you have become. Because everybody without dispute has to admit that you are being directed, controlled, educated and mastered by the Holy Spirit. For to this end Christ died for you that being now risen from the dead he by the Holy Ghost might come and live in you. And the presence of the Holy Spirit alone is the earnest of your inheritance. God isn't going to ask you whether you were baptized. He's going to look for your name in the Lamb's book of life. As one who as a sinner claimed redemption through the blood of the Lamb and to whom there was given life. How are you given life? By the presence of Christ within you who is your life. In the person of his other self, the Holy Ghost. That's why it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Because all who claim the atoning, cleansing efficacy of the blood of the Lamb receive the Holy Ghost and by his presence share the life of Jesus Christ. That's why there will be absolutely no mistakes in God's final roundup. Because there is a double seal. Your name is recorded in heaven in the Lamb's Book of Life and your name recorded in heaven is countersigned by the Holy Spirit resident within your human spirit. And if he is not there, you are none of his. And you can come banging on the gates of heaven saying, Lord, Lord, let me in. And he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, but we've cast out devils in your name. We did many wonderful works. We preached in your name. God doesn't recognize preachers. Because they're preachers. He doesn't recognize deacons because they're deacons. He doesn't recognize Presbyterians because they're Presbyterians or Baptists because they're Baptists. God only recognizes forgiven sinners who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb and who bear the indelible stamp of the presence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit within their human spirits. And there are tens of thousands of accredited church members who are going to discover too late that they were never regenerate. They were never born again. They never became the children of God. And they never were the children of God they claimed to have become. And there are some of you sitting right here who are kidding yourself. And I hardly blame you. I hardly blame you. Because you have been encouraged to kid yourself. But God doesn't. God loves you too much. God cares for you too much. He loved you enough to send his son to die for you. And he can't be satisfied with anything less than your redemption. He can't be satisfied with anything less than your spiritual regeneration. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. You are not in the flesh, spiritually destitute, but you are in the spirit. Here is the criterion. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. That is the criterion. You are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, only if the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. If Continuing in verse 9. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Jesus Christ will dis disclaim such individual. He can hammer as hard as he likes upon the gates of heaven. But he will be disclaimed by Jesus Christ. 
Because the only reason, the only reason why a person will not possess the Holy Spirit is that that person has not been redeemed. And the only reason that a person has not been redeemed is that that person has never repented toward God and has never put his trust in Jesus Christ. He has never received him believing on his name. Now the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell the human spirit which is God's instant, God to man would response of man's, man to God would repentance and man to Christ would faith. That is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Because instead of being lifeless and destitute of God's presence, in the moment that you claim redemption and are forgiven for Jesus' dear sake, the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence and to stamp you and to seal you as the blood-bought property of the Savior. And by the presence of the Holy Spirit, you possess nothing other than the very life of God. By the exceeding great and precious promises, you have become a partaker of the divine nature. And if you don't know where that's to be found, it's the fourth verse of the first chapter of the second epistle of Peter. And it is the coming of the Holy Spirit who shares with you the divine nature that gives to you all that it takes to be that for which man was created. The image of God. And this you will find in the preceding verse of the same first chapter of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godlikeness through the knowledge of him, Jesus. When you really come to know him, God gives you, according to his divine God source power, all that pertains, all that it takes for life and godlikeness. It doesn't derive from your ability, it is given. It is yours only by virtue of the fact that Jesus Christ himself is living today in you the life that he lived then. In his own body. For the Christian life is the life that he lived then in his own body. Lived now in your body. That's what constitutes a Christian. For Christianity is Christ in unity. And if Christ isn't in you. You're a counterfeit. You're a reprobate. So you can see that the Christian life is essentially an exchange life. It's Christ's life instead of your life. Because you have presented your body to him with vacant possession. As once he, in the humanity that the father prepared for him, fashioned in the womb of Mary, presented his body to the father with vacant possession. So the Christian life is an exchange life. And this is what Paul is emphasizing in the letter that he is specifically writing to a church in Galatia that is suffering from the consequences of a weak gospel. Galatians 2.20 I... The self, the, the old principle, the Adamic nature, the self-life, the I, the self that sin makes of me. I am crucified with Christ. God has written me off for what the sin principle within me can make of me as a total loss. He's identified me with his son, fit for nothing but the dung heap, has nailed me to his cross, and in his eternal and potential purpose has buried me with him and intends to keep me in the place for which alone I'm fit, the grave. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it is not the self that sin, the old Adamic principle makes of me. It is the self that Christ makes of me. When my mind, my emotions and my will are placed at his disposal as he indwells me by his Holy Spirit within my human spirit. So I, the old nature, am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, the new divine nature, live. Yet not I. I don't lay any claim to this life. It's a God-imparted life. It's the life of my Savior Jesus, who not only gave himself for me when he died, but has given himself to me when he came by the Holy Ghost to indwell my humanity. The life that I now live, I live by faith that invokes the activity of a second party. Who is the second party? Jesus Christ, now alive and living in me. I share his resurrection. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith. For every step I take, for every deed I do, for every decision that I make, for every day that dawns, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So to me, to live is Christ. It's just as simple as that. And this kind of experience begins when you're baptized with the Holy Ghost. 
You are baptized into the body. And this is what happened at Pentecost. So that Peter, without any challenge to his sincerity, to his willingness to sacrifice, for he had forsaken all. He'd left his home, he'd left his family. He was prepared to be separated from his wife. He'd left his boats, he'd left his nets. He'd given everything he knew to Jesus Christ. And yet for three years, in spite of Christ's teachings and in spite of Christ's example, he was nothing but an abject, downright faith. And at the jibe of a servant girl, denied Christ to his face and cursed to reinforce his betrayal. Now I want to ask you something. At any given moment in those three years, if there had been a challenge to dedication, how many do you think of the apostles would have been out the front? Every one of them. And there wasn't one regenerate one amongst them at that stage of their discipleship. In other words, in the hypothetical event of their dying before the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead, I believe they would have been saved. They would have been numbered amongst the Old Testament saints, just like John the Baptist. But John the Baptist, of whom there was no greater prophet in the Old Testament, would be the least. And the least in the kingdom greater than he. Because John the Baptist was never to know on earth that indwelling of the life of Christ, which is the privilege of the new church born at Pentecost. You could have challenged any one of those apostles on grounds of determination, on grounds of dedication, on grounds of enthusiasm. You could have challenged any one of them to give themselves to be a preacher. How many of them would have volunteered? Every single one of them. And without exception, they would all have run away again and left Christ to die alone. Now they're wanting his cross nor believing in his resurrection. And yet every one of them dedicated to the task of the ministry. It's possible for you and me with the utmost dedication and with complete sincerity and with as much zeal as the Jews themselves to practice religion, including the Christian faith, without having any real spiritual content to what we profess to believe. Now the Lord Jesus knew this. And that's why he was patient. He said to Peter, I've prayed for you. So that when you are converted, because you're not converted yet, when you are converted, you can strengthen the brethren. This was the Lord Jesus talking to the apostle Peter. He says, when you're converted, you'll be able to strengthen the brethren. Peter wasn't converted because Peter had never become convinced of his own spiritual bankruptcy. He still insisted that he was the man who could. Though all men forsake you, said he to the Lord Jesus, I'm the man who won't. If there's one man that you can count of, it's Peter. That's my name. P-E-T-E-R. Got it? And Jesus Christ was totally unimpressed. He says, before the cock has crowned twice, you will have denied me three times. Because you have not yet discovered yourself in all your abject poverty and utter and total and downright bankruptcy. And it was only out of the bitterness of self-discovery when he went out and wept bitterly that Peter began to graduate. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the Lord Jesus came in the person of the Holy Spirit. He indwelt the humanity of these 120 men and women, and the same Peter who'd cursed and sworn and denied Jesus Christ, these same people who'd ridiculed the women as being hysterical and had denied and repudiated the testimony of the two and refused to believe them, who, when Jesus appeared, thought he was a ghost rather than believed that he had fulfilled his promise. This same Peter stood up and on the day of Pentecost preached with such power, such clarity, such understanding and with such incision that men and women cried around him, Sirs, what shall we do? And 3,000 were converted to God. And 3,000 other men and women and boys and girls in claiming Christ as Redeemer, in publicly acclaiming him as their Lord, received the Holy Ghost and the body of Jesus Christ instead of having 120 members in particular, now had 3,120 members. And this was the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And there was added daily to the church such as should be saved. And this was the description given by the church in the early days of a convert. Nobody was invited to join an organization. They were invited to be added to the Lord. This is how they described a convert. Do you remember we cited yesterday from the fifth chapter the Acts of the Apostles? You turn again to the fifth chapter. Verse 12. Acts 5, 
By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them. I like that. Of the rest durst no man join himself to them. In the early days of the church, it was so patently obvious what was involved in becoming a Christian that nobody dared, under any circumstance, dared to pretend that they were Christians. The apostles made it abundantly clear and it was demonstrated by the quality of the lives that they lived that if a boy or a girl or a man or a woman were to claim redemption through the blood of Jesus, it meant nothing more or less than from that moment they became totally available to the indwelling presence of the risen Lord. And body, soul, spirit, mind, emotion and will, hands and feet, money and all that they had, gift or talent, was automatically and without challenge at the disposal of Jesus Christ. That's what it meant to be a Christian. And that was normality. That was pure normality. These were the normal basic terms of reference. And for this good reason, nobody who wasn't prepared to mean business in coming to Jesus Christ and wasn't prepared to honor him as Lord, nobody dared, dared join himself to them because they would have been ripped apart and the mask would have been torn from their face within a matter of minutes. Is that the kind of gospel we preach today? Do we make it really difficult for people to call themselves Christians? I mean, on God's terms of reference. That isn't the emphasis today. The emphasis is get them in at all costs. Increase the score. Make it as shallow and cheap and weak as we can, so long as we get by and enhance our reputation. Believers, verse 14, real believers, what was the characteristic of a real believer? Believers were the more added to whom? The Lord. That's who they were added to. They were added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. But everybody who openly confessed to become a believer knew that they were being added to the Lord. This was always the description that they used. If you look in the 11th chapter of the Acts, when the mighty spiritual awakening took place amongst the Gentiles, to the surprise of the Jews, Barnabas was sent, who when he came, verse 23, and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man. He was full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added, where? Unto the Lord. The preoccupation of the early church was that boys and girls and men and women might be added to the Lord. There was no partisanship. There was no come and sit on my chair. Their primary task was the evangelization, the evangelization of the total world by the total impact of the total church. Added to the Lord. And they were excited. When a boy was genuinely converted to God and put his faith in living belief in Jesus Christ, they said, the Lord Jesus has got another pair of hands. The Lord Jesus has got another mouth to speak with. The Lord Jesus has got two more eyes to see with. He's got another couple of ears to hear with. He's got two more feet to walk with. Here's a boy. He's been added to the Lord. He's sealed by the presence of the Holy Spirit of the blood-bought poverty of our glorious and risen and living and reigning Redeemer. And they were called converts. Where did the rot set in? Precisely at this point. Precisely at this point. Because the moment the early church departed from the principle that a boy or a girl or a man or a woman of any nationality, creed or color, cleansed in the blood of Jesus, was added as an individual member by baptism with the Holy Ghost into the body corporate of the redeemed church, the moment they departed from that principle, that's when things went wrong. This was the first mark of carnality in the early church. And it divided itself basically into two categories. And the first category you'll find in the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians and the third chapter. And I'll be as hasty as I can, but we need just to see these two categories that we might get a true, valid, panoramic view of the situation. Paul writing to the epistle... In the epistle to the Corinthians, and incidentally, as I reminded some of you at lunchtime, he was writing to that church which above all the others prided themselves on their spirituality. Because they were the loudest in the 
practice of certain charismatic gifts. And yet it was to this particular church that Paul has to write, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. I could only speak unto you as unto carnal, still dominated by the flesh, which is hostile to God and is not subject to the law of God. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. You are yet carnal. You're fleshly. You're babies in Christ. You've been regenerate. You are born again. You have received Christ as your Redeemer, but you haven't yet grown up. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are you not carnal and walk as men? That simply means that your behavior patterns are characteristic not of the redeemed led by the Holy Ghost. Your behavior patterns are characteristic of an unregenerate world. Within the church community, you're playing party politics. Within the church community, you are idolizing the personality cult. Within the church community, you have become partisan and denominational. For while one saith, verse 4, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Isn't this a mark of your carnality? So what was the first evidence of carnality in the early church? That they departed from the principle that a man redeemed in the blood of Jesus and genuinely converted to God is added to the Lord. Instead, they substituted that a man converted was added to a man. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. And of course, this is a mark of carnality that has been perpetuated all down the history of Christendom. I am of Luther. I am of Calvin. I am of Huck. I am of Swingley. I am of Menon. I am of Darby. We're Lutherans. We're Calvinists. We're Wesleyans. We're Darbyists. Or anything else you like. You might even be a Southern Baptist. And this is a mark of carnality. This isn't a mark of spirituality. This is a mark of carnality, brethren. While one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? We are servants only. We are ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. We gave you nothing. If you've received anything which is valid, if you've received anything which will last for eternity, it's only that which God has given you. We gave you nothing. We simply introduced you to the principle of faith whereby you have invoked the activity of God's own redemptive and regenerative work. I planted. Apollos water. That's all we did. Who gave the increase? God. So then, verse 7, notice this very carefully. Neither is he that planteth anything. And understood, neither he that watereth anything. Would you tell me this? If a man is not anything, what is he? Nothing. That's all he is. Neither is he that planteth anything. And if he is not anything, he can only be nothing. And that's all you are, and that's all that I am. And my sole office, if I am to be faithful in the discharge of my responsibilities this week, is to be no thing, simply a mouthpiece. And if anything is to be given to you this week that is valid for eternity, I don't have it. Only God. God gives the increase. And he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Now that was the first mark of carnality. The adding of men to men and it was apostolically repudiated. For they that planted then and they that watered then were one. I and my brother Apollos, I and my brother Peter, we are one. We are only servants. God is the only person who quickens the dead. He's the only person who can replace death with life. Now what was the second category? As opposed to these who added men to men instead of to the Lord, you'll find recorded in the 15th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles those who added men to movements. Certain men, verse, 50, uh, verse 1 of chapter 15 of the Acts, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
No matter what you believe about Jesus, no matter how you may have repented toward God, no matter how you may have put your trust in him, even though you have received him believing on his name, unless you have towed the party line and you have submitted yourself to those demands that we ecclesiastically make upon you to make you acceptable within our particular religious community, you cannot be saved. We don't recognize you. Do you know anything about that? And this was the first major crisis in the Christian church. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. Are we commissioned by God in the preaching of the gospel to add men to men, men to movements, or men to the Lord? And this was the first crisis conference that was held in the city of Jerusalem under the chairmanship of James. When they were come to Jerusalem, verse 4, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, they were believing Pharisees, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. In other words, although they professed to be believers themselves, they were jealous of their party machine. They were anxious that the free invitation of God through Jesus to be reconciled to himself and share the resurrection life of Jesus Christ was going to be bad for their own particular business. And so they added to the gospel. As some detract from the gospel, so others add their traditions and make it a close shop. And when they had been much disputing, verse 7, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and women, brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now you know the instant to which he's making reference. Peter is here making reference to the conversion of Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, a good man who needed to be saved, a good man whose goodness couldn't save him, but a good man whose goodness God did not despise, for God never despises goodness, even in the unregenerate. Don't kid yourself on that. Sometimes we talk about good works as though God hated good works. God does not hate good works unless we deliberately once enlighten substitute good works for Christ's work. But those who are ignorant of Christ's work are honored in the good works that they do in their ignorance. Because all too often it is the symbol and symptom of a questing and a seeking soul. And we know that God's angel visited Cornelius and he said, your arms, your good works and your prayers in your unbelief, not knowing Jesus, have been brought up before God and are held as a memorial in his presence. And because he knows by this evidence that you are a seeking soul, I want you to go, said the angel, and call a certain man by the name of Peter, and he will tell you what you ought to do. God knows you want to be saved. God knows you want your sins forgiven. God knows you're trying to find peace with God, your maker. But you're going about it the wrong way, Cornelius. God doesn't despise you for that. You've been doing it in your ignorance. But God says, if a man seek, he'll find. So send for Peter, and he will tell you what you ought to do. And you remember that when Peter came, he preached Jesus, crucified and risen. And that there would be forgiveness of sins for all who, repenting, would believe on his name. Do you remember? And Peter goes on at this conference and says, verse 8, God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. He put no difference between us and them. He purified their hearts by faith. God honored the personal relationship that had been entered into on the part of Cornelius, his family and his servants and his friends. And God recognized the faith relationship that embraced God's grace, that invoked his redemptive and regenerative activity. And on the basis of that faith relationship, neither circumcised nor baptized, God gave them the Holy Ghost, whose presence is the criterion of believing. We believe, verse 11, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And in summarizing the event in the 11th chapter, on his return to Jerusalem, where those of the believing circumcision contended with him because he, a Jew, had dared to go into the house of a Gentile dog, Peter described it this way, Acts 11. As I began to speak, verse 15, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us when? 
at the beginning. As we on the day of Pentecost were baptized into the body of Christ by the presence of the Holy Ghost within us, sealing us as forgiven sinners, so as on us at the beginning, God the Holy Ghost came on him. And remembering the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? So we understand from Peter's statement here that the condition was believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, that the result was the gift of the Holy Ghost, and this he equated with what the Lord Jesus had promised as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when they had heard these things, verse 18, they held their peace and they glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles, as well as to the Jews, granted repentance unto what? Life. life. Repentance unto life. This is the gospel that we have to preach, men and women. It's repentance unto life. We preach repentance toward God, faith in the Lord Jesus as Redeemer, that we might receive life. Whose life? His life, by the presence of his Holy Spirit, to whom we gladly now yield the totality of our being, body, soul, and spirit, to become a body wholly filled and flooded with the Holy Ghost. And only the presence of the Holy Spirit, and only as we walk in the Spirit, are educated, directed, controlled, monopolized, dominated by the Holy Ghost, do we bear the characteristics of our sonship. And nothing less than this will do. And if you are not being directed by the Holy Spirit, and if it isn't patently obvious to your own children in your own home, and your workmates at the factory bench, or your colleagues down in the city block, if it isn't patently obvious to the neighbors across your garden wall that your life is being directed and dominated by God the Holy Spirit, you should tonight have severe doubts as to your redemption. You should begin to ask yourself, have I ever truly become... Because if I'm not being what I have professed to have become, it is doubtful whether I ever wanted to become what I wasn't prepared to be. This is gospel. This isn't deeper life. This isn't convention. This isn't luxury. This isn't an option. This is normality. This is the gospel that was preached by the early church and because of the strength of their gospel, they evangelized the then known world in one generation and changed the face of nations. And for generation after generation, though they were thrown to the crocodile, burnt at the stake, the torch of faith has been handed down to you and to me in our day and generation. I want to know how many boys and girls who profess faith in Jesus Christ, who being converted on the basis of a weak gospel today, would throw themselves into the, into the mouths of lions. God help us when the testing time comes unless you and I are prepared to get back to first base and embrace the whole counsel of God and stop playing church and become Christian. God is commissioned to become totally expended in these last dangerous hours of a perishing world. We don't have time to play the fool and to pretend. Years ago, on the coast of Britain, a coast guard recognized the distress signal of a sinking ship in a violent storm. And as the emergency was signaled to the coast guards, they turned out. And the team went down and they got the boat down to the water's edge. And in the crew there was a boy. He had just joined the crew. This was his first call. And in the darkness as he heard the howl of the wind and the thunderous noise of the waves as they beat down upon the shingled shore, his heart sank. And in terror he gripped the arm of the old bosun. He said, Sir, we can't go out in this. We can't. We can't go out in this. We'll never come back. And the old man, veteran of many such an emergency, with his gnarled hands, his rugged but kindly face, put his great arm around the kid's shoulder. 
And pointing out into the darkness, he said, Son, out there men have perished. The call has come. We must go out. We don't have to come back. That's not our business. Our business is to answer the call. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I want you to think in the presence of God, in the presence of Christ. What's the quality of your Christian life? If the criterion is that in every area of your being and every strata of your life, business, home, recreation, money, time, thoughts, ambitions, if the criterion is that you are being constantly directed, controlled, dominated, mastered by the Holy Ghost, are you a child of God? Or is it all a fairy story? A make-believe. A thin veneer. An evangelical crust. If you want reality, stark, naked reality, to become totally expendable for God, to recognize his call and to go out into the dark places of the earth. You tell him so. Just tell him so. Don't promise him anything. You wouldn't trust your own promise. Because you know your own heart too well. Just tell him so. Tell him to begin a mighty work in your own heart. But out of the bitterness of self-discovery, you might graduate into that fullness of life which God imparts to those who become expendable to God. We don't have to come back. That's not our business. Our business is to answer the call. Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross. And you've told us that unless we're prepared to make that cross our cross, forsaking all that we are, we cannot be your disciples. Some of us tonight, Lord Jesus, want to be your disciple. Desperately. And we're just trusting you to make it real in our experience. Do what you need to do to put us in the place where you want us. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen. You take your hymnals. And we're going to turn to number 231 as our closing hymn. <coughs> There'll be no invitation. <clears throat> In the popularly accepted sense, you've already had it. And God calls upon each one of us to do stern business. By your bedside. There are some folk for whom the moral issues of this week are going to have radical consequence. Revolutionary consequence. God changed your destination some time ago when you were converted. God's just about to change your destiny. That's why you can't do this in a flash. It's not the impulse of a moment. It's not some emotional response. 
This is calculated to make you totally expendable for God. If you really embrace all that Christ is, monopolizing your being, that's the most dangerous thing you could do in terms of your own human ambition. And all the preconceived notions that you may have for life. Some of you fellows and girls, you may be at college. For all you know, the moment you give Jesus Christ right away in your life, he's going to cancel out everything that you ever envisaged for the future. That's why I'm not going to ask you to enter into this kind of covenant with Jesus Christ lightly. I know what it meant for me. It'll certainly mean no less for you. Let's make this the language of our heart as we close with this song. Then we shall pronounce the benediction and we'll go home. But as morning by morning, night by night, I, as God enables me, make known to you God's terms of reference for normal Christian living. Before the end of this week, I'm going to ask you, having entered in the silence of your own heart into some new covenant with Jesus Christ that allows him as God to be God in terms of your humanity, I am going to give you, before we finish, the opportunity to bear glad, hilarious testimony to the fact. But I want you to face the issue before then. I don't want you to wait till then to face the issue. The invitation that I shall give at the end of this week will be to those who have entered into this relationship and just can't hold back. Who are just so excited about the prospects that you want the opportunity to bear a testament of the fact that you've become wholly expendable for God. And the future is going to be as exciting as God himself. Oh, love, that wilt not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee, I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O cross, that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust, life's glory dead. And from the ground, the place of my burial, there blossoms red. Life, your life, eternal life, God's life. That shall endless be. And thy grace, Lord Jesus, greater than all my sin, and thy constraining love, dear Heavenly Father, and the indwelling power and presence of God, the Holy Spirit, be our abiding portion now and always until we see the Savior unashamed at his appearing, face to face, and seeing him like him forever with the Lord. Amen.